hello everybody. This is Shannon Knight, for those of you who don't know me, a two-time breast cancer survivor. I have my twin sister on the phone, ready to share with me. I am so grateful and honored to have her share with all of you what she went through, what we went through emotionally with the breast cancer diagnosis that went from the beginning of diagnosis all the way through to getting uh, clear of cancer, free of disease, and the roller coaster that we went on. Sis? Hello. Thank you for joining me. I'd like to hear if everyone is able to hear my sister. I did a test run earlier and we heard her perfectly fine. I see uh, Melanie, Tiff, Paula, can somebody give me a thumbs up? Jenny, uh, go ahead and talk, Jesse. Hi, can you hear me all? This is Jesse testing one, two, three. This is fun. <laughs> okay, we've got Paula Costa. We got thumbs up. Okay, sis, I am so happy. You and I have had a life together. We had a lot of health problems that were the same. Remember when our knees would uh, dislocate when we were kids? It happened about the same year. Do you remember what that yeah. was like, having to go through that together? We had a lot of um, empathy towards each other. So although, you know, you're there screaming, I, I could feel it. Once you've experienced it, you feel it. Um, I don't know if it's just a twin thing or just um, people who are very uh, empathetic. So I definitely feel I'm one of those, and I know you're <clears throat> one. I went through the same thing with you. I would watch you running and getting ready to go around a corner, and I'd be so uh -huh. terrified that your knee would dislocate just running around the corner. Yes. You know, I still, I still have that with my daughter now. I, I worry about her knees. <laughs> I go through that too. So when I was diagnosed the first time with breast cancer in 2006, what did you go through as a twin? Shock was the first thing. And I don't know that I knew I was in shock, but I certainly wasn't going to accept your diagnosis. And I felt like, oh, no, this is not going to happen. Shannon. And because in a way, that would mean it's happening to me and I have to be in control. So did not want to believe it and spent a lot of time researching. I think that's when I really cared about cures was when I found out you had been diagnosed with breast cancer. I wanted to know every single thing you were doing, um, what the doctors were saying. And it's not that I didn't trust them. It's that I know there are many different <laughs> methods to cure cancer and I just felt like I wanted you to do the treatment that was going to work best for you or best for me <laughs> so yes exactly and now now this is a twin thing yes but would you say that our family we have such a big family mom dad our siblings went through a similar thing and did you have discussions behind the scenes behind my back about this many times and it goes back to the diagnosis um did she how many tests you know how, is she sure she has cancer <clears throat> and is she to be believed is maybe it's just a cyst you know <laughs> is she going to do radiation she better do chemo or she better do radiation and everybody has their own packaged pre-packaged plan um that sort of it's the ground running right they're in shock i think they, they just want to get a quick fix for their loved one not realizing some of the things that we say and that we do um can actually be stressful and hurtful on the person that is being dealt dealt this blow the one with cancer okay those of you who are just jumping on i have my twin sister on Facebook Live. She is also a breast cancer survivor. 
she went through the same thing I went through with fear emotionally. And I can definitely tell you, I went through the same thing with her diagnosis, totally afraid that she wasn't going to beat it, even though I did. In fact, I'd like to go back to a time, sis, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. When you were diagnosed two years ago, what was it like for you, even though you knew I beat stage three and stage four without chemotherapy, and you as a VA going to a veteran's hospital and being told to do chemotherapy, what did you go through during that time, regardless of having a twin sister that had many of the same health issues? Well, the hardest part for me was how long it took for me to even get a diagnosis because I had been there a couple of times and was told that it was just a benign tumor or cyst. And so I went through the frustration of I might need to go outside of the VA. And as a disabled veteran, you know, everything is free for me. And now I would have to go out and get outside of uh, diagnosis, which I did. And um, then I went back to the VA and told them, look, I've got cancer. And so at that point, what I noticed that really made me frightened was that nobody seemed to think it was a big deal, and I did. Right. <laughs> uh, even after they um, went ahead and did the ultrasound and the biopsy, it was just as if I had the stomach flu. And then what? And mentioning chemo, mentioning chemo to me, uh, they had already pretty much assumed that that was the course of action I was going to take was radiation and chemo. And when I told them that that's not what I wanted to do, that I wanted to seek the same treatment that you had received, they were shocked and thought that I was giving myself a death sentence. Imagine what so, that was like. Yeah. They believed that, you know. They did. Oh, I know. I do understand. Um, I mean, this is how it's always been. It isn't just cancer. I've always felt like when I went into um, the doctor for something, I think it's more with women, that they just sort of assume that we should be able to handle things better, Okay. maybe better than men, and, and then also even our pain is not taken seriously right so I, i've been feeling sick also and i think that's what was frustrating is i felt very weak very tired i didn't have the energy i used to have and have a female doctor telling me you need to eat healthier you you should americans don't exercise enough and i think that i'd already told her i was eating organic once you had been diagnosed so there's some just feelings of not being um, validated. Okay. So let's go to how long did it take you to make the decision to do alternative medicine? Oh, how long? I already made up my mind. Okay. Not even, no, not, split, not even a split second. Okay. And did you find yourself delaying things that seemed very legitimate? Delaying because of maybe family stuff, things that you had to do that were important. Did you find yourself? Never. Okay. I never delayed. I always had to wait. You know, I always thought it was odd. Here I've been diagnosed with cancer and they're scheduling me for the ultrasound like two weeks from now. And then wow. the, the biopsy, everything. I was like, wow, it's not even a big deal to them. Right. Like, what if I die in two weeks? <laughs> right. We were just discussing that in my interview yesterday That with Avenome Learner. He said, we get the diagnosis and it hits us like a crisis, like something just happened when it's been growing inside of us slowly. And we're still there. We just, we just know it now. But the intensity, the emotional stuff that you go through is, I, I told him yesterday, it's like being caught, drafted to fight that sense of urgency, like you're going now. 
and you're in a different place than you. You're not even the same person anymore, right? Talk about that. Did it change your identity instantaneously? Yes. Suddenly, I was a person who would have to wait my turn. Wow. You know, it wasn't about me. I, I didn't feel like it was even a female thing. The breast cancer patients were kind of all lumped together with other patients. And I don't mean just oncology. The VA in Nashville, there's no real oncology center. <clears throat> and you don't see all the, the, the things that... Susan Coleman has, I guess, passed out at all of these hospitals and, and medical offices. It was just like sitting around a bunch of veterans and nobody knew what I was going through. You know, we're all taught a certain way to behave, there's certain manners, and, it, and I just went past that. I didn't want to be polite anymore, and I did. I, I But it was so frustrating even at home because that's really where you need to hold it together right i have a daughter you can't show fear um so everyone's used to seeing jesse or mommy so strong and i would not let myself cry i remember i played a lot of games on my um laptop to distract me Right. Uh, I did that, that too. My daughter's games. I mean, I was, I almost became addicted to it because it was the only way I could stop thinking about the fear. I'm so looking, I'm looking at a comment right now that falls in line from Kristen Lee Schlupp. People want me to just function normally and it's treated like a car repair. Like you get new tires and you're on your way. What do you think about that? That's exactly right how you feel yes it's almost like i don't want to talk about it because you know you can talk just about anyone and someone's had to deal with cancer either with a family member or a friend or their their spouse or themselves or their child even so you're afraid to bring up your own cancer because there's no blood it's all on the inside right there's nothing showing nothing you look exactly the same as you did the day before that's right so what about the identity part? Do you find that once you tell people they treat you differently and that you feel maybe I've talked about it once, I can't talk about it again because it'll sound like I'm, I'm obsessing over something and I don't want them to think I have self-pity. Do you find yourself overthinking your emotional, um, how you show up? in social situations with loved ones, family, friends, holiday seasons coming up at, you know, a reunion? Well, for me, I sort of shut down and really tightened my circle. And I, I didn't want, I wanted to be alone. I didn't want anybody agitating me. And I wanted to be able to save my energy. So there was like a reserve. People, um, the people that I talked to were very few. There was you and family and my husband and my daughter and my boss. But there was more of a, are you sure you're doing the right thing? Are you sure that this is what you want to do? And they really wanted, this, they did this positive talk. So if I did mention, so they asked you, how are you feeling today? Oh, I'm feeling tired. Well, you got to think positive, okay? Got to stay positive. And that really isn't what I want to hear. Right. I'm already doing that. <clears throat> okay, how about when you have started your cancer treatment? You're at the hospital. You're in Mexico. You chose alternative cancer treatment. Day one. Uh, panicked, afraid. What if it doesn't work? What if I'm the one that's going to die and my twin sister's the one that's going to live? I remember uh, that. What was my lifestyle like? You know, maybe I should have never drank. Maybe I should have never smoked when I was, you know, smoking. Or um, maybe I'm the example. You know, I'm going to be used as the example for others in life uh, 
to see me be strong through it all, and that, but ultimately I'm just going to end up dying. I get you, and I'm glad you had the courage to say that. Uh, it's the taboo word, talking about death, talking about how to face that transition, questioning faith, values. Uh, I, I want you to go with that and let me know how you felt when you thought about that because I, I get you and I know a lot of people that are going to listen to this interview with you, sis, they're going to get it. And I want the truth out, the vulnerability of emotional, the roller coaster. And I, I spoke about how I felt like I was 12 years old, afraid of death. And that all of a sudden I started going, and you would know, we were raised to believe in God. What if God doesn't exist? How does that resonate with you? Well, um, first of all, between you and I, we, you know, there's always like the, the good twin and the bad twin. And so <laughs> I was sort of iron tailed, the tough twin. I was the soldier. I was, I was almost proud. I wore it honorably, that title, and that I could, that I wasn't the empath that I know that I am. So suddenly, I'm really having a hard time being who I actually believe I am, this strong, arrogant, whatever. Suddenly I am this baby that's weak and, oh my gosh, who's going to take care of Madison when I die? Um, oh my gosh, uh, what if I don't make it, you know, into heaven? You know, is there something I forgot, something I, I failed to do? And suddenly I feel like I need to be doing more, not less, to sort of make amends in case I do end up dying. Um, it's almost like preparing for a wedding. You know, you suddenly have all these things that you have to do. And you act, you act stronger, but it's, it's, none of it is for me. No, it's, you're it's doing a it for everyone else. It's, it's, a, it's a play that I'm, I'm an entertainer and I'm afraid at night when I am alone to cry for fear that I won't be able to stop and that I'll just go crazy with panic and having, you know, having an anxiety attack. And I did have anxiety attacks and it, it really mentally and emotionally messed with me in a way that was worse than any kind of training that you could go through in the army in basic training. It it is an you are a you have a new identity. It's strong like a soldier. And I didn't want anyone feeling sorry for me. I didn't even really want anyone questioning me. I wanted to eat whatever I wanted to eat. Um but sometimes it was like screw it, it's too late. I'm going to just eat this ice cream. I'm going to just smoke the cigarette or I'm going to drink some alcohol. And then other times I felt like, but what if there is a chance? What if that's not going to be me? And I am going to survive this. I don't want to suffer. So right. I would go back and forth between those two identities. I understand that. I went through the same thing. Uh, do you remember the time when I called you? This is a story that's outrageous. There's actually a painting that was done of this moment with me on the beach. Do you remember the moment when they gave up on me? You called me. You asked me, how did your appointment go? And they stopped my radiation. And they did some imaging and said, I was on round 22 of 40 radiations that were planned for my sternum to stop it from growing and it paralyzing me. I didn't, they already told me I had three months to a year to live. But they said the radiation on this one spot, even though it was in my lungs and my ribs and everywhere, could stop that and slow it down so I wouldn't be paralyzed. And when they stopped that radiation because I couldn't lay still and I kept coughing, you called me and asked me how I was doing. And do you remember my attitude and how I was when I talked to you on the phone to see if I was okay from that appointment when they gave up on me? I seem to recall you were very... Uh, down, depressed, and sarcastic. Trying to cheer you up. 
You, I told yeah. you I was going to drink wine. Yeah. I told you I was going to have a cigarette. Yeah. I was angry. Yes. And you said you are not okay. And you came and you picked me up and you went to the beach. You, I said, I can't go to the beach. I've got a burn on my chest. You said, so we'll get you a shirt. And you put this light white long sleeve shirt on me. And we got a green mm -hmm. skirt on me. And that, I remember that. that drive yeah. down Canaan Dune Road with your attorney in the back seat from Nashville. And do you remember how every time I would cry and say, I'm afraid of dying. I said, it's not like they said it was, you really are afraid. And you would give yes. me, you made a concoction. We're going to go ahead and talk about the truth of all of this. You made a purple drink and gave it to me in a Tupperware container because you were so concerned about my fear and emotions. And it tasted like grape Kool-Aid, but I'm pretty sure it had a little vodka in there because I felt really calm by the time we got to the grocery store to get some floaty, floaty stuff for the beach for Madison. And then we got yeah. to the beach. Do you remember that? I do. Do you remember what music, what you would do when I'd start yes. crying and I put my head in my lap? I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Do you remember what you did with the music? I think I, didn't I play Journey? You play did. Music that I did and the Eagles, uh, or Don You Hanley. played and you rolled down the windows going through those Cane and Dune tunnels to the beach in Malibu and started trying, trying to, to cheer me up. Yes. I will never forget I that. I remember that that compassion and you, you reached for everything from our youth that had a good memory attached to it. Every music. good memory. Yes. Yeah. Boys of Summer, Don Henley. Yes. <laughs> when you started singing. I, I did. The sunroof open in the SUV. Yeah. You got me it to was sing. really beautiful. Yes. That was the crush too about it. I just, I could feel and, and sense everything. Yes. Well, I remember that you wouldn't stop at anything. There was nothing you wouldn't do during that time to make me smile, to make me laugh, to make me turn away from dying. So yeah. I wanted to talk to you about that because, one, I want to tell you again how, in front of everybody how much that meant to me. Here I have a twin sister, and I, know, I knew you were afraid. So now let's go back to you and you being diagnosed and you telling me on the phone, I'm not as strong as you. I was walking through Hobby Lobby, I was on the phone. You just said, just tell me what to do. Tell me where to go because you were torn and you just kind of had a frozen moment. I remember that uh, I didn't want to do any of the thinking or where should I go or I said, just tell me everything that you did, I'm gonna do exactly what you did. I wanna, I wanna go to Mexico. Tell me what I should be drinking, what I should be eating, even though I probably knew most of it, but I couldn't remember because I was numb. The overwhelmingness of it all froze the you. Realness, it was too real. And, you know, that always goes back to Madison, my daughter. And um, I never thought of missing my husband, James. I suddenly found myself trying to qualify him as if he was going to be her caretaker and you know he's her stepfather and he loves her but suddenly i felt like i needed to prepare him train him how to be me wow <laughs> train madison how not to take shit from men <laughs> wow <laughs> because he might forget to teach her that and yeah it was all about madison and i had to be there for her and and grow her up strong like me Right. And then in front of her and healthy in front of her, you had a, a different identity because you wanted her to see courage. Yes. Okay. I, I would start it. I would. Well, Madison is amazing. She never felt like she was losing me. She never cried once. She always told me, you know, mommy, it's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. You're a fighter. You're strong. She said things that I never, ever thought. She saw me as usually as friends, not children. Okay. I want to close this. I'm sorry, sis. I want to close this before I forget with something that's very important. 
now I've gotten through, I'm six years out free of disease and no evidence of it. You're two years out. How do you feel? Do you feel secure? Do you feel reassurance? Does cancer cross no. through your mind daily? Does it? Uh, it's What's it like? on my mind daily. Okay. I never think it's over, even though I have a clean bill of health. It's never, I don't, first of all, I didn't, if I'd have been diagnosed maybe correctly the first time, but for a year of, of going through not being diagnosed, and it ended up being exactly what I thought it was. So I don't want to, you know, touch too much every day. And, you know, I'm going through the reconstructive part. And so every lump is, to me, a potential cancer. You know, we've got a lot of lymph nodes, <laughs> glands. That we never knew we had. Yeah, I'm very suspicious now of everything. It's a lump. To validate other people, men and women, going through uh, their... They're, they're free of disease. To validate people who go through an ache, a sharp pain, a twinge, what is that like for you? And I'll tell you what it's like for me after you tell me what, what it's like. What if it's cancer? Me. Just what if it's cancer? Yes. There's a lot of people out there, uh, I've heard it, where they think that they're paranoid because they're going, well, what if it's cancer? What if cancer came back? I've got a backache. What if it's, what if it's cancer? Well, here's Here's a good example if you want to validate some people. How many times did I called 911 to come and get me uh, because I thought I was deathly ill and thought I was even having a stroke now and a heart attack and every other thing that could go wrong now with the body that could get missed. And I, they'd end up sending me back telling me I was having an anxiety attack. Right. It's like the walk of shame. <laughs> It's embarrassing, and then you're afraid. You don't know if to call them. You've got a stomach ache. Your lung hurts. You get, you know, that metastasis for breast cancer goes to the lungs, the bones. So you're to be quite honest. Before this happened, you either go to the doctors and they're like, "Well, why did you let this go so long?" Or you go to the doctors and they're like, "It's nothing." Yes. So you're never truly validated. You're reprimanded, or you're not validated, or you know, and I, I really do wish doctors, uh, I know that they're supposed to detach from the patient to a point, you know, or they would be just taking on all the sorrows of every patient that's ill, terminal illness, cancer, right. whatever they think is terminal. But there has got to be a way that they can listen and say something on, you know, this sounds it sounds like you've got, you know, a series of little symptoms going on here. Why don't we get to the bottom of this? Yes. So that we can get the fears out of the way. If potentially this is something not very serious and let's cross our fingers. There's a way to validate and say, let's, you know, we're going to get to the bottom of this. But most doctors, unfortunately, even some female friends of mine who are doctors, they don't have that in them. Yeah. And it's one patient right after another. I, I, I get it. I understand it. I went through it. I went through nine months of them just trying to get me in and out of the office, diagnosing me with costochondritis, with asthma for nine months, the wrong diagnosis, and not encouraging me or prompting me to go get it checked out. And, and we kind of have to do that ourselves. We have to lead in all of that. So... What do you I do? I remember Dr. Payan. Mm -hmm. Dr. Payan, uh, you know, when I was out here, I, kept I could not breathe at night. I could hardly ever breathe. And it's like a permanent congestion, and nobody could diagnose it. I had x ray after x ray. And then I get to Mexico, and one cat scan, and he found the lesion. And, wow. it, you know, I had to go all the way to Mexico for that. I remember that, and I remember they missed another diagnosis. Do you remember the red rash that was misdiagnosed at the scarlet. VA hospital, and it was scarlet fever? Scarlet fever. And Dr. Yeah. Crayon did oh, some testing. I think it was in the middle of the night I got the phone call that my sister... My liver was a mess. I got hepati uh, acute hepatitis, my kidney. There's how these things, I think, get missed is exactly why... 
uh, a lot of people who are intelligent and care and want to live will become hypochondriacs or appear so because now you're doubting everything. You don't trust your doctor. Yeah. Well, that happened to you and it happened to me. We both got a misdiagnosis. And then mine turned out to be cancer. You had cancer with complications of scarlet fever. And I think it was a, a viral. My immune system was, I have an immune, autoimmune disorder, which you really have to have a strong immune system if you are going to pursue that route of chemo and radiation. Yes. You won't make it. Right. Because that's what it, it destroys the immune system. But I will say this, that I realized it, it is, it truly is the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. They, they may not like you, and that should not be a patient's goal, that we come out of there and the doctor goes, wow, she's a good girl. They don't care. I don't care if it's a doctor that does care about his patients. The fact of the matter is, you better make use of every minute that you have during that hour seeing that doctor. If somebody's paying for that, and you better make them tell them, I want this test. I want that test. My insurance covers this. I want it done. Yes. And Or they're not going to do it. You're absolutely right. We I get a lot of so letters like that. about being a nice, polite patient and be more of a proactive patient. Your own advocate. Yes. Yeah. Sis, we're going to do this again. I am so grateful for you, and I know many other people will be grateful for this interview. They're going to see it over, I'm not taking it down. It's going to stay up on my website, shannonite.com. You and I have been through breast cancer together. Here's the emotions. We can validate other people who are going through the same thing where they feel kind of crazy because every little pain and twitch or inflammation, we want to check it out to make sure it's not cancer. And I know you agree with me. We encourage you to get it checked out, get the symptoms checked out, especially since I have mentioned that my tumor marker never read that I had cancer. For nine months, the UCLA test for it, my tumor marker never, ever showed that I had cancer. And it was full-blown stage four bones, lungs, mets everywhere. We encourage you to look like a hypochondriac and run to the doctor. Who cares? Who cares what they think about you? They're not the going to be thinking about you later. So, yeah, and the sooner you get it, the better. And the best support people that you can have in your life are those that will encourage you to do that instead of minimizing you, discussing, I need to get this checked out. You need to be smart. You need to be your own advocate. And you need to get the symptoms. If your bone hurts, it's great to have support groups to write and ask, hey, I've got a bone in my a left side of my rib cage that hurts. What do you think I should do? The only advice that everybody should be giving you on those groups is get your little booty to the doctor and get some imaging done. Don't tell them to start drinking a certain this tonic or a certain supplement. You're wasting time. You need to have the reassurance to rule out cancer once you've already battled it once. You can get metastasis. Learn about metastasis. Be smart. Don't go to your group. Go to the doctor first and then share what happened with the group. I, I, you know, in closing, it, 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 along the same lines, I will say this the difference between your cancer and mine is that mine did not. It was so close to the uh, lymph nodes and it did not go into my lymph nodes. And I'm God. lucky. But you know, had I not been pushing and, and, you know, okay, so this doctor says I'm fine, it's just a cyst, I had to go outside. There's patients that aren't going to be willing to do that or maybe can't afford it or too busy, but that is the difference. It's right next to your lymph node, and once it's in the lymphatic system, that's when it becomes metastatic cancer. It's on so a journey through your blood. You do count. That's right. We don't know where that little rogue cell or rogue cells are going to go and land and stick. And I encourage everybody that is blessed with only, not blessed, but you're at stage one, you're at stage two. 
that is the time to get treatment. Don't wait for it to be stage three or stage four. Don't have the attitude of, well, it's not so bad, so I don't really need to. No, you're, you're lucky if you get to find out at stage one or stage two. You don't want it to be in the lymph nodes. It's a, it's a tougher battle. So thank you, sis. I love you to pieces. I love you too. Goodbye, everybody. Good. Have a good day. And I really appreciate I a, you helping out with this. Thank you. I got you. a lot out of this. I, I don't really talk about it. So I know. I'm glad you asked me to do this. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing. You, you tried not to. So <laughs> <laughs> stinker, iron tail, Peter Cottontail over clank, and out. Clank, clank. <laughs> they probably don't even know who iron tail is. Uh, well, those of us that are our age know who Peter Cottontail and iron tail are. <laughs> he was yeah. the best bunny. He's the best bunny. Peter Cottontail was the best bunny, and I will always say that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. I love you. Bye, sissy. That was fun. I really wanted her for so long to get on and talk. And I don't, if you guys are writing, I can't see anything. It's not showing me. So, uh, you can, I'll always respond to your comments later, as you know. Holy cow, I guess people were on there. Um, didn't know that. So, hi, everyone. And I hope this interview with my twin sister helped shine a light on the emotional impact, um, what we go through with the identity, what we go through with um, upon diagnosis, after going through cancer, trying to get the tests that you want, trying to be validated, trying to be supported on the choice of treatment that you want. It's a tough journey. And then when you're better, going through the fear of, is it back? It doesn't leave us. And I just want to say to loved ones, friends, family, those of you that are in our life, even six years down the road, I still can get a pain in my shin or my elbow or anywhere and go, oh my gosh, what if my luck's run out and, and this is it? So just have compassion and be aware that they're still going through fear and they're, they've changed. I love you all. And I look forward to anybody that would like to come on here with me on the phone, just like my sister did, and talk about the emotional impact that cancer had on their life. Because I think that we need to create more awareness about that. All right. Bye.